excited being there today. After our break, we had a, a break for almost three weeks, I think. So uh, about a month actually. So it's so nice seeing everyone. I want to wish all of us a very, very happy New Year's. And I want to send the greetings from the Vice Chancellor of our university, Professor Olufemi Peters, who is right now at a meeting, another meeting, but he sent his greetings. I can see my people, I can see our immediate past Vice Chancellor, Professor Abdallah Oba Adamu, and I can also see uh, Professor Tijani. Wow, very nice, Professor Yosunde. You are welcome. Sorry, I'm excited seeing everybody. So we are going to have a, another wonderful presentation today of someone physically present here to tell us about her migration experience, not like a, the usual presentation. She's going to tell us a, a life experience. So I'm sure we are all going to have a very good time. Dr. Abisoye, you are welcome. And um, yes, I hope more people will join us. I would have been here earlier to allow people to come in because of the internet challenge. So our center, Center of Excellence in Migration and Global Studies of the National Open University of Nigeria, we are yet here again to present another seminar series to you in this year, 2023. And uh, we're going to briefly tell you about our center that is gradually getting old. We are now approaching our third year, which was started in February 2020 with a third fund, a SIP fund. And um, its business is to look at issues of migration and global studies. And uh, we serve as a bridge between humanity and the future. And our main vision, a mission, is to provide sustainable leverage for interdisciplinary research in migration and global studies. And um, we have our core, core values, which include integrity, inclusion, diversity, service, participatory. And um, also we want to uh, serve as an agent, to serve as an agent of national and global policy in migration studies, to seek grants for academic activities and outreach, to organize short courses, seminars, conferences, and public lectures. And we also publish a, a peer-reviewed journal in migration and global studies. And um, uh, our volume two, issue two, came out at the end of last year, uh, November, electronically. But uh, I'm very sorry to, you, uh, to say that uh, we are here to get our print copies. We are working on it. We have some technical each in that uh, 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 publication so to, to bring the uh, hard copy you know, to people for now. But you can be rest assured when you go online, everything there is going to be a replica of what you have in the print copy. And so without uh, wasting much time, I want to say that I want to introduce the speaker for today. The speaker for today is uh, uh, a medical doctor. And um, she is no other than Dr. Dipti Joseph Ndoma. Sorry, I hope I got the pronunciation right, but I know you Are correct you me. Right. Okay, thank you so much. So she is, like I said, a medical doctor. Her education she had at St. Petersburg State Pavlov Medical University, Russia between 2001 and 2008, and um, lactation consultant examiners in January 2020, certified as international board certified lactation consultants. And um, she, she is also registered at the medical, uh, by the Medical and Dental Council of Nigeria. And she has uh, other, uh, other qualifications from the United States of America, in Texas specifically, Baylor Hospital, where she has a CPR training, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, BLS, P 
PALS, ACLS, all between May 2011 to September 2011. And um, I would also like to say that um, she has certificate of provisional registration as a medical practitioner certificate of annual practicing license. And um, she also has some clinical skills and so on and so forth as a medical doctor. But her work experience, let me tell you briefly about her work experience, her work history. She's been head of department and medical advisor of obstetrics and pediatric care clinic in Abuja, Nigeria from 2019 to 2022. And she's also a lactation consultant as we saw from her qualification in private practice from 2021 to the present date. And um, she worked in Asokoro District Hospital, Abuja, 2016 to 2017. And Tel, Tel War Medical Center, New Delhi in India from May 2010 to, 20, to July 2010. You know, observership under the head doctor was what she did in that place. And then of course, at uh, St. Petersburg Pavlov State Medical University, Russia, she also had a brief experience there from January 2008 to February 2008. And um, uh, she helped in managing wards and taking first hand case history. And um, she also worked at uh, St. Isabel's Hospital, Chennai, July 2005 to August 2005. We had some summer training by Dr. Margaret Gimelo and so on and so forth. You know, she's had her medical, she's been into practice at least from time to time. But she had her stay in Nigeria for quite some time and I'm sure she will tell us about Nigeria, about India, about America, waste of time i welcome dr dipsy joseph duma to give us his presentation her presentation thank you so much doctor you are welcome to start your presentation um we'll give you about 40 minutes and then um, after which people will give comments and uh, you will not answer everything at the end of everyone's comment thank you so much over to you doctor so very good afternoon to everyone here Thank you so much for the introduction, Dr. Anyathor. And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to present on the subject of migration. Uh, so it's been an interesting time for me going back into the past years of my life and compiling all my experiences as a migrant. Uh, um, are you able to see my slide? Just wanted to make sure before I start. Yes, okay. we can see your very first slide on, oh, it's fine. So, um, so I've lived as a migrant in five different countries across the globe, and I would like to start by saying that my experiences, the experience of ha I've had in each of them was unique, but one thing that stands out most in that is my reason for migration each time to every different country was different. So um, let's start from the very beginning. So um, we would start in the Republic of Yemen. That's where I was born in 1983. Now to give a little bit of the background here, my parents are from India and they traveled in the 1970s to what was then South Yemen. Uh, so till 1990, Yemen was North Yemen and divided into North and South Yemen. And North Yemen, Sana was the capital and South Yemen, Aden was the capital. And so then in the 1970s, when they were still divided, my parents traveled there, they migrated because of good job opportunities. And uh, they lived there in a city called Sehut. If you can, if you see the map here, you would see towards the right-hand side, it says Sehut al Gamira. That's the city they lived in. It was relevantly a smaller city, but um, 
life was good. Life was good for them as foreigners who were there to uh, enhance the life of people there with the healthcare provision that they came to provide. And because of that, because of how they were enhancing the healthcare system there, they were treated with high respect. They lacked in no way. They led quite a rich and satisfying life. But of course, like every immigrant, they had to make adjustments. And one of the biggest adjustments was learning the language. Very few people spoke English and most of them happened to be expatriates. So uh, one of the biggest challenges was learning the language and having to communicate with their patients in Arabic. Um, other few challenges were like they, they were used to fresh food and vegetables in India compared to they got only canned food and uh, powdered milk compared to the fresh ones that they were uh, used to in India. Of course, they were far away from family. And uh, another challenge they had, they had to travel to the other bigger cities like Al Mukulla and Aden for um, recreation, for shopping, even to give birth to me, even though they were, were working in a hospital. The city of Mukulla was bigger and they had a teaching hospital there. So they had to travel there to give birth to me. And then even uh, for other reasons, they had to travel to the biggest city that was the capital of South Yemen, Aden. Um, and the travel was not just like once in a while, it was, it was on a weekly basis because uh, Yemen being a Muslim country and they were very devoted Catholics. The only church that was allowed to stand was the one in Aden and they had to take a flight not just a bus or a car, they had to take a flight literally every weekend to travel to Aden to be able to attend mass. Uh, my next slide shows a little bit of the life there and how the cities looked. The first one is, the first two slides are from Aden, the capital city of South Yemen. The, uh, the first slide is a monument or a park in, in um, Aden where um, Queen Sheba has been known to visit that place on her way to seeing uh, King Solomon. The second one is the church that they would visit every weekend. And uh, that particular picture is for my baptism in the church there. And the last light is the city where they were actually living and working, which was Sehud. So um, on the whole, they had a very good and rich and satisfying life there. But um, in 1986, there were rumors of civil war between, there was a lot of tension between the North and South Yemen. And because of these rumors and for, for their family safety reason, my parents had to migrate back to India. So in 1986, you can see um, on the map, I've drawn the arrows with the red. They moved from Yemen back to India and um, they had to find their footing again back in their own country this time. Luckily for them, my parents um, could stay with um, my dad's family in their family house till they found new jobs, a new place to live. They traveled to a few different states in India. And finally, they decided to choose New Delhi as their new destination and a new place to migrate and settle down which had not just better job opportunities this time, but they had me in mind and it would be a place for better education for me. So uh, um, it looks like it's the, I'm like been talking about my parents and their migration story. So now let's switch to my migration story because this is where I remember my life from. I don't remember much of Yemen, but I remember growing up in India. And um, in all of my migration experiences, the common factor has been that I've always lived in places where diversity has surrounded me. And New Delhi, the capital of India, was such a place. It was an amalgamation of diverse cultures and traditional backgrounds because people from all the different, almost India has almost 30 different states. And people from all over these states were living in the capital city. So I grew up knowing different cultures, different cuisines, different way of dressing up, different languages. In my own house, uh, we spoke English, my parents' native language, and Hindi, which was the common language in the North, in, especially in Delhi. So we spoke three languages growing up. And so it was a rich experience growing up in the capital city of India. And um, here are a few slides showing my life there. 
the first one is the native town of my parents where they first went to when they came back from Yemen. And that's my um, dad's family house where my grandparents lived, where my dad grew up. The second uh, slide is from uh, my school award ceremony and then um, amusement parks where we used to go for weekends and um, you know, <laughs> getting to know uh, famous personalities in India and growing to dress up like them and cultural presentations, family photograph. Um, I don't know if you can guess who, which one of them is me in that picture. And then uh, the Taj Mahal, which is the seven wonders of the world, which is very close to New Delhi. And finally, my graduation day. So this was my life from age of two to 17. And um, it was a very interesting life uh, for a family um, where the parents had come from a different culture, even though it was the same country. And I was growing up to totally understand a different culture. So it was a mix of cultures and languages in just my own immediate family. So finally, when I graduated my high school, I was 17 and it was time to make decision to, you know, what's gonna be my career path, what's gonna be the decision I make of what I wanna do with the rest of my life. Uh, because my parents were in the healthcare sector already, I was very used to hospitals or very used to how the healthcare worked and, um, you know, syringe and needle and scalpels were not nothing new to me. And somewhere along the line, it, the desire to become a doctor grew deeper and deeper. And so I chose medicine. I started applying to medical universities in India. But um, my uncle had a um, family friend who had just graduated from St. Petersburg in Russia and who highly spoke of the university there. And when my family sat down and looked at things, it was even more economic, actually, for me to go study there than continue my uh, studies in India. So we came to a place where um, we had to make a decision. I would be migrating now. First time alone to a different country. I was going to be away from my family, a country that's very different in the climate, the food, the language, the culture. So my family had to make um, and take actions to make sure that my migration by myself to this new country was going to be smooth. And um, so one of the things I did was I connected with the Russian Cultural Center in New Delhi. I started taking classes in Russian already before I was even um, admitted into the university there. I started um, learning everything about the food, the culture, the way to dress up for winters there, um, how people travel around there. I did that by not just connecting with the Russian Cultural Center. I contacted graduates from the university that I was going to go study in to try to understand how life was going to look for me there. I had to prepare myself in every way, psychologically, physically, mentally. Um, so finally, we came, uh, I got, the day came and I got my admission and I was on my way to St. Petersburg, Russia to study in the medical university of St. Petersburg, Pablo. And here is a few slides from my life there as a student. So I had to learn to adjust to the weather not just uh, dress up uh, for winters, but I had to learn how to walk uh, when it's snowing, walk on snow. I had to learn Russian because uh, my medium of education in Russia was in the Russian language. I had to learn to travel around the city in, unlike India, where we use buses and cars, metro system was the main and the fastest and the most reliable way of travel there. I had to learn to eat local cuisine, which was very bland compared to the spicy and flavorful Indian cuisine. Um, but you know, as life as a student would call for it, you can't always have the privilege to cook. So I uh, very, um, very quickly learned um, to enjoy and love the local cuisine. The education system was very different from what I was used to in India. For example, in India, a classroom would be um, the size of 40 to 60 students, 
Whereas in Russia, a professor would count a size of 10 students in the class to too many for him to deal with. And um, so there was a lot to adjust to. There was a lot that was different, but in all of that, I had to learn the, to make the best uh, most of everything. And uh, so, and then came 2008 and seven years had passed by of me living there as a migrant student. And 2008, I graduated as a medical doctor from the University of St. Petersburg, Pablo. And uh, it was time for me to now go back, move back to India, to my own country. But now what happened was uh, I was no longer going back to my family in India. I was going to be alone in India because the very year I graduated, my parents, my, my siblings immigrated to the uh, United States of America. And the family immigration, unfortunately, did not, um, did not involve me because the immigration law was that in a family, a child about 21 would not be counted as part of the immigration. So while I now was back in India, my family had immigrated to the United States of America. So I had um, to now figure out uh, uh, till we got it figured out of how I could join my family in the in, in the United States of America, I was living in India again, and um, that was another adjustment because even though it was my own country, I was used to seven years of already living a very different lifestyle. So by 2011, when we had figured out how I could join my family in the United States of America, it was yet another shift of culture found myself migrating to yet another country. And in 2011, I moved to Texas, United States of America. Um, yet another way of living, yet another way of culture, yet another uh, whole life to adjust to. Uh, because my medical degree was from Russia, I had to now find my career path and um, and how to settle in my career path in the United States of America. I had to write a whole um, other list of licensing exams. I had to get my, um, my degree certified in America. And so in all of that, I was uh, trying my best to not just find a footing in my career, but also adjust to a different you know, weather and climate and, and way of living in a new country. And uh, while I was in the middle of doing all of this, um, so there's there's something I have to share here where for which I'll have to go back a little bit. So in 2008, when I was leaving Russia, I was not just leaving with my medical degree, but I was also leaving with the heart of a young man from Nigeria. Uh, so we uh, had um, gotten engaged before I left Nigeria or I would say pretty much in a serious relationship. And we kept in touch while I moved from India to United States of America. He finished um, studying his master's and moved back to Nigeria. And now I was here in America trying to find my footing and uh, along the way also trying to, for both of us to be in one country and to you know start life together. He um, had um, gone through all the different routes to, by which he could join me in America. Um, but that did not work out. So we had to look into plan B and that would be me joining him in Nigeria. So um, within just two years, I found myself back again in a place where I had to now migrate to another country uh, adjust to not just this time um, to living in a different culture or you know adjusting to new food or weather but this time it could be a whole adjustment of living a, a married life I was going to be not a single person anymore I was going to be married now I was going to have in-laws I would have to redo exams and relicense myself as a medical doctor in yet another country and who knows, this could be probably the rest of my life I have to be living here. So by now, I had enough of immigration experiences or migration experiences to know how to best prepare myself for this new journey ahead. 
um, I was already in the education in the university uh, there. So I took classes on anthropology to understand how different cultures and mindsets work. I took classes in psychology. I um, called all my Nigerian friends to counsel from everybody who was not just living in Nigeria, but in Africa. Um, I contacted um, through people in church. Um, I found a lady, an American lady who was also married to a Nigerian and living in Nigeria already. So I, I went in and out like all the way all around. I could to understand and equip myself the best I could to this new culture that I was going to migrate to. I learned uh, all everything I could about Nigeria, about all the different states, the politics, the food, the culture, the way of dressing. I mean, it was so intense that by the time, the day I landed in Nigeria, it was my youngest sister-in-law's birthday and she wanted to go to have yogurt. And me, this is me here who has just landed for the first time in Nigeria, Abuja telling her, oh, I know a yogurt place in Buse zone two. And they were like, what? How do you know that you just landed in Nigeria? Are you sure this is not your first time in Nigeria? So that's how intense my preparation was to go to Nigeria. Um, this are, um, so here is me uh, on in Dubai airport on my way to Nigeria on yet another migration experience that was awaiting me there. Um, so we got married within um, the first three months or so of me being there. Um, he got a very good idea that I, 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 I would fit in very well into the culture. I had done my homework. I, I was willing and I, I had come with the mindset that this is going to be my life. And um, so we got married. First, we did the court wedding. Then we did um, church wedding. Um, so now, yes, I was married and I was here in Nigeria. And now I needed to find my footing here. So I had to find out about the pre-medical exams that I needed to take, which took me to Lagos. So for me, this was a migration within, within a country itself. From Abuja to Lagos, I'm sure I don't have to explain this to anybody. It's, it's, way, it's a whole different culture. So it's a whole different place. It's a whole different thing to adjust to again. But it was, it was not bad. It was all good for me. I was, I was very happy to, to see another place in, in Nigeria. I was very happy to um, have the best Amala. And uh, I was very happy to um, get to know how the medical system works in, in Nigeria. And um, I thankfully got um, licensed. I passed my exams there and I was now back in Abuja. And now this time being back in Abuja from Lagos compared to when I came from United States of America, my, my way of viewing Abuja was totally different. I felt like, uh, I mean, no, uh, I, I, in no offense to anyone, Lagos and Abuja, both are amazing to me. I love both the cities. But for me personally, uh, as my experience, I felt like, wow, I was, <laughs> I, I, I appreciated and I loved Abuja a lot more than when I first came from United States of America. I, I when I had to adjust a lot more. So um, from there, it went to now starting um, my life as a doctor in Abuja. Um, I was privileged to work in Asukoro General Hospital. And that was a bigger way of knowing and learning about the culture and, and the people mindset. As a doctor, I got to see, especially because I was in Abuja, I got to interact with houses. I got to interact with Yorubas. I got to interact with Igbos. I got to learn you know, I, I can I can hear the languages clearly. I can tell you the difference between Igbo, Yoruba, and Hausa. I can I can speak a little bit. I can try to interact with my patients. I mean, it was a whole lot of experience, not just something that I was reading or looking at, but I was living the experience now. I was eating all the local cuisines. Um, I had come, now I was a wife who was working too. So I knew me and my mother-in-law was sitting compare notes of way tomatoes are cheaper in Garki market or tomatoes are cheaper in this market. And you know, the understanding from the locals that tomatoes are cheaper during dry season. So you buy bulk and you, you know, puree and, and you freeze it. So I was like, 
I gave my all and out of connecting with locals, connecting with expatriates who were also Indians, connecting with expatriates who were also Niger wives. Niger wives are basically foreigners who are married to Nigerians and living in Nigeria. And Niger Wives Association was founded back in 1970s. And so I was privileged to connect with them and, and live a life, you know, sharing my life experiences with them and also being a part of the ESCO of this community. I connected with Indians who were living there. I connected with other expatriates who were there for other reasons. So, you know, you get information and you get to see the country through different eyes and learn through different ways. And so, yes, I knew now where to get, you know, local cuisines, uh, how to get stuff for making soup for my husband from the open market. But I also found out where to find, you know, Indian food, which, you know, markets or which places supplied Indian food and which places I could find stuff like cheese, which was not a common um, food that was used by Nigerians. And um, so, I mean, overall, the experience is enlightened and, and is better when you're connected. You are networking with not just locals, but even expatriates of who are there for different reasons. And um, so, yes, um, I came to a place where I had uh, known about Nigeria through all the different people I heard about it from and from the, all the things I read about it to a place where when someone said Amala, my mouth would start watering. When someone started playing Nigerian music, my body would start shaking. So I was from someone who I was an outsider to I was in all in a Nigerian myself. Um, so this was my life in Nigeria. Um, a few slides from my wedding day. Um, I was a part of um, the church. I'm a Christian, so I was part of the church um, that I was going to the local church. Um, I was teaching in the children's department there and also part of the medical team there. And there's a photograph with my seniors and consultants in Asakuro District Hospital. There's one from when I was in Luth in Lagos. There's one where I braided my hair. I was trying to even, you know, see what braiding the hair feels like, although my very delicate hair couldn't take it for more than a day. Um, I graduated from the Bible College of Redeemed Christian um, uh, Church of God. And um, that I loved wearing the gale. I, I went from a person who first time saw the, a woman wearing gale to be like, what is that? Why is she tying that thing on her head? That looks weird. To someone who did not feel complete without wearing a gale. Now I don't feel complete. I feel gale. I look at gale as something royal and majestic. Your outfit, uh, to me, a Nigerian outfit doesn't feel complete without, you know, the final uh, majestic thing of having the gale on your head. And um, this was uh, one of the latest pictures in 2021 at my um, older brother-in-law's wedding in Calabar in Cross River. So uh, within Nigeria, I had a rich experience of traveling to Cross River, to Ogbomosho, to Ibadan, to Lagos, to Jaws, and, and, and it was a very rich cultural, beautiful experience. And I would um, not want to exchange it for anything else in my life. Um, so um, yes, I thought this would be probably my last migration uh, destination. But in 2021, uh, it so happened that uh, my husband's company had a client of over five years who were in the United States of America, and they enjoyed and they valued his, his input into their company so much that they decided that they wanted to move him to America. So here we stood um, having to make a decision once again, uh, or at, at, at least me once again, having to move to another um, place. Well, you might think that, yes, you've been to US before. This was not going to be something new to you, but it was going to be a new migration experience because before when I was in the United States of America, I was a single person and I did not need to know and do a lot of things 
then, which I would now need to do if we were to migrate to the United States of America, I would need to find out about how the school system works for my children. I would need to know uh, how they drive in America because I was not driving back then before. I would need to get a driver's license. I would need to know how, about the tax system, how to get a good credit score, how to get um, insurances, how insurance works in this country. And there's a whole lot, a whole lot to learn and adjust to and a whole lot migration experience that was going to come ahead for which we had to prepare, um, we had to start preparing. And uh, the difference this time was in my migration experience that it was not going to be me migrating to another country, but it was going to be me with my immediate family migrating to another country. And so the preparation had to be multidimensional with me keeping in mind my children and how it was going to affect their lives and how I had to prepare not just myself, but them for this migration experiences. And um, you know how it was going to affect them having to leave their their social life and their family life, even as little as they were. Um, my youngest was just about uh, turning two, and my older son was uh, five when we were making this decision. And um, they already had their friends, their you know their grandma, their auntie, their cousins that they associate with every day of as part of their life. That they were now have to understand they might not be seeing them as often as as they do and also find a way to now keep traditions and memories alive from their fatherland of Nigeria find I had to go shopping and look for souvenirs and things that I would keep in my house when I go when I now move to, to America to make them always remember uh, their culture and where they come from uh, find ways to make sure that I have everything available to make Eba for them, which they love. And we basically have Eba every night for dinner in our family. And, uh, you know, uh, find, uh, I'm, I stitched all kinds of traditional clothes for them so that, you know, we still get to wear the traditional clothes here um, whenever we have gatherings with Nigerians. Um, so we had to prepare in a whole lot of different way and keep a lot of different things in mind for this move that we were going to make of migrating to the to United States of America. So um, to sum it all, um, I had to go through a lot of uh, different experiences with different things like food, weather, culture, the ways of travel, the currencies used, the education systems have been different in all these countries, the medical profession, how it works, both for professionals and for people seeking medical aid has been different. Yemen was Arabic. In India, I spoke Hindi and India has over 200 languages, but I spoke Hindi, Malayalam and English. In Russia, I had to learn Russian. In America, I had to learn American English, which I never understood when people said there's English and there's American English and there's British, you know, and there's Indian English. There's like, um, for example, uh, in Nigeria, we call this vegetable of um, the, the, uh, as eggplant, but in, in India, we call it brinjal. And in America, we call the same thing aubergine, you know? So, in, within English, there's so much to learn. In Nigeria, I got to experience pigeon and Yoruba and Hausa. I was in uh, in the church culture in Nigeria. We sang a lot of Yoruba, Igbo songs. And so I came across all the languages there. Uh, Food-wise, I mean, I think I was blessed because being a food lover, I got to enjoy, enjoy all these cuisines all over the world. Of course, Yemen, I started with Serilak. I don't remember anything much of anything else there, but in India, we have rice and roti and tapioca as a staple. Russia is rich with, uh, you know, their meat. Their meat is the best meat I could ever have in anywhere in the world. And um, the soups, the steaks and burgers and pies in, in America. Oh, I mean, Nigeria, don't get me started. I'm going to miss Nigeria if I'm going to talk about food in Nigeria. Ekpan Koko being one of my favorites, Moi Moi, Akara, I miss all of that. All the swallows, my favorite being a um, uh, fisherman soup. 
and white soup. Uh, I miss it very much. And the weather, the weather has been very different and, and drastic almost in different places. Um, the cultural experiences has been amazing and very diverse. And I think um, here I would like to stop a little bit and, and share a little bit how, how interesting it was for me um, in Russia. One of my group mates was having her birthday and I decided to gift her a set of handkerchiefs. And uh, she looked at me and she was like, deeply stop. You don't give handkerchiefs as gifts to someone you count as friend or family. Handkerchiefs are a sign of enmity or, you know, or someone you don't like. And I was like, what? I didn't mean to do that. And and of course she knew I, I did not know the culture at that well. So she did not take it as an offense, but it made me realize giving a gift to someone of a different culture, you have to think about it or, you know, find out about it. In um in India, you you be walking on the road and there are strangers walking everywhere, but you're not going to you don't greet people. You don't just greet anyone you don't know. But in Nigeria, I uh, was with my husband and I would stop my car and be like, "Excuse me, can you tell me how to go to this and this building in Busetu?" And my my husband would like you know nudge me and say, "You didn't greet them." I was like, "But I don't know them. Why would I greet them?" But so in Nigeria, no matter what, you always, whether you know the person or not, you say good afternoon, ma, good afternoon, sir. Whereas in Russia, you don't, I mean, if you don't know them, you don't even expect a smile. You, I mean, you can't expect a, even a smile from the other person if you don't know them. Like you go to a grocery store in America, they were like, hello, how are you? How's your day going? But in Nigeria, they were like, that was 50 rubles and very straight face, no smile or nothing. And when you ask them, why did they do that? They're like, they don't see the value in why they should smile and be friendly with a stranger when they don't know them. So it's like different cultures all across. In, in Nigeria, you would sit with strangers and someone would start eating and they would off and they would say, um, please come and join me. And I would be like, what? Did he just invite me to join him to eat? I don't know this person. Why would he do that? You know, it's, it's um, you the cultures are so different and so interesting. And the culture is what makes you understand the mindsets of the people. For a person in Nigeria who's offering me as a stranger to come and join in their meal, this is what, this is basic etiquette for them. They have grown up, you know, that way. People in, and especially in the Yoruba culture in Nigeria, they will bow down, they will bend and greet an elderly person. Whereas in, in Russia, you, um, you, you talk, you refer to every person, whether or elderly or younger or the same age with their names. And that was a very big adjustment for me coming from India to Russia, where I would call my teachers, sirs, ma'am, uh, you know, call my elders, even if it is a stranger, auntie and uncle, I had to learn to refer to my professors by their name. I, I have to I have to be like Dmitry Sergeyevich, uh, what is going to be our, you know, homework for tomorrow or whatever like I had to it was something I had to overcome the barrier of that for them respect is shown in the tone and way you talk not the prefixes or suffixes you attach to names or by you know on your body language of bowing down or bending down and so I mean culture is was rich across all over and you have to learn to adjust to that and and what helps best is by trying to understand the culture from the mindset of the people who are living that culture and um, uh, so in the end after having this rich globe total life how has it affected me um, it has affected me in the way that I have very diverse documents. If I was to, you know, be interviewed by someone, I have my birth certificate from Yemen. I have a passport from India, my resident permit from Nigeria, my school certificate from Delhi, my medical degree from Russia. And now here I'm living and working in America. I'm diverse in my own family. I have an Indian passport, man, and my husband has a Nigerian passport. My children have American passports. I'm diverse as a person. I'm not 100% anymore Indian or Yemeni or Russian or Nigerian. I'm, I'm a mix and diverse as a person of all the different cultures. And I think I have the privilege to choose the best of all of them and, and be the best of all of them. I live in different time zones because I have friends and family all over the world. So I have my phone has the time zones of all the different places 
because I need to keep connected with everyone. I have to keep connected with my in-laws in Nigeria. I have to keep connected with family in India. I have to keep connected with friends in Russia and friends from Russia who have now gone and migrated to all over different parts of the world. And so in the end, who am I now? I am now an American. I am now an Indian who was born in Yemen, who has a degree from Russia, who's married to a Nigerian and is now living in America. So, um, and here is a picture to kind of show that. Um, this was from, um, I'm wearing an Indian Ankara, I'm sorry, a Nigerian Ankara top with an Indian skirt. Um, it, this was a ramp walk um, on International Women's Day in Abuja that was organized by the Indian Nigerian Women's Society. Um, and to sum it all up, so, what have I learned from my migration experiences? I've, one of the biggest thing I've learned is where you live matters. So if you're in the prime of your life where you want to make a difference, where you want to make a change in this world, where you're so invested in your career, if you're going to be in a place where basic necessities are going to be the bigger problems and challenges, it's going to affect you. And of course, you don't have a choice. If you are living in a place like that, then you have to keep that in mind and try to overcome that before you now get to make bigger impact in the society. For example, childcare, if you say I was living in Nigeria and I need to go back to work after I gave back birth to my children, the um, kind of childcare available is going to be very different from someone who is now living in New Zealand or, or, or England or even in India. So um, where you live matters and you need to understand that very well before you get if not, it can stress you and it can just keep you very limited. You need to appreciate what you have. Um, you could be living in a very non-developed country and complain about everything that is good about a developed country, but you need to enjoy the freshness, the uniqueness, the, the fresh vegetables and you know um, everything good that that place provides and appreciate because if a negative mindset is only going to kill your experience living in that place. You need to create opportunities, okay? So if there is no, uh, there's an issue with power or there's an issue with something, how there's there's opportunities and, and problem solving ways you, you can come out of that problem that is there. You try to solve that problem. You try to um, give something to the society that helps everybody out. Uh, for example, one of the ways, um, I prepared for coming to Nigeria. I was like, oh, yes, I found out that power was a problem and I always needed to have my charge, my phone charged, no matter whether there was power or not to keep connected with my family who would get worried. So I figured out that there was something called the, the battery, the, what's it called? The battery charger. The, so that you can plug into, you know, the big batteries that charge phones without electricity. So you, you create, you find out, you create, innovate new ways to make your life most comfortable you can in the place that you're going to. You connect with what is in, in common. You might not like maybe the food or the, the weather, but you might love the music. You connect with what is in common to make your life rich. You have to have an open mind to go into a new culture set, setting as a migrant. You have to try to understand the culture and why things are done a certain way there from the, from the outlook of the locals there. So um, having an open mind is very, very important. Now, tactics that I learned that help while migrating before traveling, research all you can about the place. Everything that you can find out from, from the end, now life is easier, it's more uh, real and, and closer because of internet that, that we have access to. So I know everything about the country and the lifestyle of people in that country. Then compare what your lifestyle is right now. How is it going to be different? Just like how I found out about the power bank. I knew my life here is, is, is I don't have electricity power problems which is going to be a problem probably when I go to Nigeria. So how do I take care of that and still make myself comfortable? I was going to get married in Nigeria. And from all the uh, friends I had, they were a lot darker skin than I was. So I was worried 
So who would do the makeup for my wedding? Would they have the same color foundation? Would I be able to find that in Nigeria? So I, I bought all the cosmetics I wanted to wear my wedding in, in America and learned how to wear makeup before I got there. But fortunately, I was able to find a good makeup artist. But from my side, I did everything I could to make myself comfortable and compared my life where I was to how it could be different and did everything to make myself comfortable in the new place to at least have a smooth start off um, after arriving, connect and contact, you know, keep all the locals that you can have, whether it's, I mean, Facebook and Instagram, all these things have, have made it so much more easier to connect to people in different countries and, and contact the locals, contact the expatriates there. Network, once you are there, network with everyone find out everything you can from the eyes of the people living there from the eyes of the locals from the eyes of the expatriates of the same nationality of different nationality from the eyes of the expatriates who've traveled with the same intentions as you have traveled with learn about everything you can about the mindset and the outlook of the locals you know try to engage from their point of view and in the end experience everything that you have read about you know, experience it for yourself, whether you like it or not, just go and try that local cuisine, just go and try to wear the local ways of, of you know, dress up the local way, um, experience the music, experience the dance, experience everything you can that you've, even if, if might be uncomfortable, but because you are there, only when you experience it for yourself, will you be able to understand certain things, how it works in that country and in that place. And I think that sums it all up for me here. And thank you so much for listening patiently. Yeah, thank you so much, Debbie. It is a wonderful presentation. I enjoyed every bit of it. Thank you so much. And uh, especially the last part where you gave us some hints on adjusting when you are a migrant. I'm happy to say that uh, our last uh, Presenter, one of our last presenters last year, here, Simona Tre, all the way from Austria. And I'm sure she was listening when we were talking about Amala and all that, because I knew that uh, Simona enjoyed Amala when she came to Nigeria. And uh, I know she, she will tell us about it when we ask her. She was also a wonderful adjuster. She was like, she's been in Abuja and Nigeria for a long time. So I'm happy to hear all these reports. And um, you are really a globe trotter because you have really experienced uh, many countries, five, and you have lived in almost all the five, you know, for quite some time. So this is really beautiful. I want to say again, thank you so much for this presentation. And uh, we are now going to open the platform for people to ask uh, questions. Yes, I can see that Professor Aneto has joined us. We are welcome, Professor Aneto, Professor Kagbare. I can see him there and so many others I cannot uh, really. Okay, Dr. Emina, thank you all for making time to come. And uh, I don't know this person, but I can see, uh, is it Professor Emi Adegako? I hope I'm right. You are all very much welcome. Now it is open for us to contribute to this uh, beautiful presentation. And uh, she has stopped sharing her screen so that uh, we can now, uh, make our comments. I saw one in the chat box. I think it's from Professor Sewaji who said, where you don't greet, how do you not ask for help? Something like that. I saw that sometimes and I smiled. What a wonderful question. You don't greet, just come to me and ask me, where is this? I may not answer you, but I don't know, but uh, hey, I'm sure that uh, will tell us how they're able to do that in the course of this, in the course of this discussion. So the floor is open, the virtual space is open, and um, let me see, can I see hands up? I thought I saw some hands up, I'm not seeing any again. So, okay, Dr. Emika, okay. and then Dr. Abisoye will follow. So let's quickly get your comments and questions. Thank you. And then comments and questions, thank you. Okay, let me over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, the presenter, and uh, it's, it's nice to be back again in 2023 on this platform again. Uh, and, I, and I think this is a very good introduction, uh, starting the year with uh, uh, a live migrant who, who migrated 
to different parts of the world. But I'm, I'm, I'm worried about the connectivity that she raised because as human being, uh, I'm look, trying to look at the perspective of the cultural relativity that had existed, which has you know, sustained her. Recall that uh, in my presentation, I've always been concerned about adaptation, how people are able to coping strategies. How, so how was she able to cope, you know, managing and moving from, especially the, the role, playing the role of a wife, a mother, and then also uh, a student, you know, in this case, because it, it's not going to be easy for her to uh, adapt and so on. So cultural relativity, all this why, has she been able to really settle down to say, okay, so what is it that is relatively common in this, country that she has actually migrated to. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. Aled Toye, your hand was up. Yes. Can you please make the comments? Thank you so much, for Professor Newton. I want to thank the presenter for honoring our invitation. It's been quite um, a lecture that she gave us. Uh, I just want to ask her if she had any, or to just give us one or two. We know she has been talking about the positive parts, uh, aspects of her migration. Does she have any negative experience to share in the five continents so that we can learn from there? It cannot be all that rosy for some people. So let's have some, maybe some challenges that she faced. Apart from, she just mentioned it, um, just uh, not specifically. Let us have some specific experiences that she had uh, apart from the yes. negative aspect so that people can learn. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, uh, for that. Because, like you said, it can't be all rosy. So let's get some legacy parts. I want to say that uh, Dr. Ndoka B here is the handwork of Dr. Abisoye. She's been very instrumental to these foreigners coming to our platform. And I am really grateful to her and the love she has for what is happening here at this center. Thank you very much, Dr. Abisoye. So I'm sure Dr. Has, has noted that and she will give us a feedback anymore. I can say as emeritus professor, I must be in the car driving. Welcome, sir. Happy New Year, sir. I I'm can sorry, see, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't join earlier because I've been in, uh, you know, in an engagement. Okay, all right. I, I welcome. Yes, I'm sorry. At, uh, I, I had wanted to join, but then I was held down by the ES of uh, NUC. Okay, okay. So at last you managed. Sorry for and that. I, I, thank yeah. you, sir. Professor Abdallah thank was you. here I'm at the sorry. beginning. I think uh, maybe is it network or he has another engagement? I can't see. Yes, yes. The okay, I'm, but sorry. I hope I'm sorry it. for that. Yeah, welcome, sir. Next, the next so, one, I'll make sure I come in. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Congratulations. 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 Happy New Year. Yeah, I wish you the same, sir. I wish you the same, sir. Thank right. you so much. Okay, okay. okay. Congratulations Professor to the Titani. presenter. Yes, yes, she did a good job. Thank you. Okay. Um, All right. Professor Tidani's hand is up, so let's listen to him. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, congratulations to Dr. Doma, Deputy Doma, for sharing this important um, experiences with us. Uh, as I was listening, I began to think about those who are clamoring for STEM without what we now call use, use research pedagogy. <sighs> The presenter is a medical doctor. And if she had not mentioned the last lap of our migration to Houston, or is it Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. I, was, I was going to ask her for a address in Abuja and enlist in a medical center so that whenever I'm in Abuja or in Nigeria, I can do a follow-up. Why? You see, 
she showcased that you cannot, you cannot, and I've always been saying that, survive, make an impact, had value as a STEM trained person without the non-STEM. You can never be a good and excellent medical doctor, nurse, without understanding the cultural milieu, the diversity, the language, and the audacity to adapt to your locale in your profession. Perhaps you want to share with the power that be in your location that is Nigeria, this particular presentation so that it can resonate and give birth to a renaissance whereby we begin to talk about H STEM, that is humanities and STEM. Rather than just saying that it must be STEM, it is not the way to really make a sustainable development in the global community. And that is the lesson I'm getting from this. Well-crafted, unambiguous, smooth. I have not wasted waking up at five, six, my time zone in Baltimore to listen and to learn. And I thank you most sincerely, Dr. Dapti Doma for this brilliant exposé of the many travels. Of course, there will be challenges, but I think speaking about the positive and also giving the tip, your last presentation is indeed important for this phenomenon of Japa or Ajala travel that you have presented. Before you leave, when you leave, even when you are right, to really make and add value. I thank you most sincerely. The Lord will continue to be with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for those uh, uh, wonderful words of uh, admonition and uh, your comments generally. I cannot see any other hand up. Maybe we allow Dr. Deputy to answer or you know, comment on the one set so far. Three people have spoken. Maybe later others may join. Okay, over to you, Doctor. Thank you, Ma. Um, thank you, everyone, for the comments and um, for the questions too. Um, so the first question that asked about um, adapting and connecting. Um, so uh, I think what helped me with that was not just keeping in mind um, what I knew um, from before of uh, medicine as my profession or uh, what, I, what knowledge I have of a mother from before, from my own mother and seeing other mothers or from my pediatric experience of, I mean, my pediatric, um, how do you, uh, the experience of treating pediatric patients, I would say, mm -hmm. but also mingling it with the, connecting it with the knowledge I have from Nigeria or from the locals. So for example, I know, uh, okay, at, at six months, you can start feeding the baby solid food. So what, what I grew up with might not be all available where I was now in Nigeria. So what do the locals here feed? There's pap that is available, to, which is nutritious. There is um, you know, palm oil. There is amala, which is very soft and easy to, to digest. And so, not, so integrating my knowledge from my experiences of growing up and, and from other countries and from other places with what is available in the local uh, sector. 
was how it, it, it helped me to adapt and connect. So um, um, I think that would be a good example to, um, and okay, so for in the medical sector, I would say, okay, I came from America. So where there is CT scans readily available and for every small thing you do an X-ray and a blood test and coming to Nigeria, it's not that these things are not available, but these things are a lot more expensive for many of the locals. And then you now adapt to learning local and, and ways to diagnose and treat with local measures. You know, uh, you have to do palpations and percussion and to make do without an, uh, an X-ray. Um, you might not have a tourniquet to tie for your patient to draw blood. So you, what do you do? You tear a, a glove um, uh, and then, you know, you make a tourniquet out of it. So the, the adapting and connecting works by the knowledge and experience you already have, but at the same time being open to what the locals have to teach you in every way, whether you are a Christian, whether you are a mother, whether you are a doctor, whether you are a wife, in every way you have to connect all your experiences and then make it happen where you are. I hope that answers the question. Um, so the negative aspects of the negative experiences I've had, yes, of course, there's always pros and cons and good and bad and everywhere and everywhere you go. So I think um, from out of the top of my head from in India growing up, I uh, I think there's already a lot of stories all around the world of how it's not very safe for women all the time. Um, I uh, knew it was not going to be, uh, I had like, a, um, how would I say, a few experiences of watching people do nasty things to women around me. Um, and that was not very good. Um, so safety wise, I did not like where I was living in India. But when I moved to Nigeria, funny enough, a country which is could be racist to non-whites, I felt, I've never felt as safe as I felt in Russia compared to anywhere in the world. I could be walking middle of the night on the road in Russia and know that I was going to be safe. Um, I don't exactly know how and why it, that is, but that's how, what my experience was. Then again, um, in Russia, the negative part was um, being a foreigner. They did not like very, foreigners very much at that time when I was living there. And everybody expected you to speak Russian. Hardly anyone spoke to you in English except your Russian teacher or maybe some of your professors or your group mates and classmates that wanted to help you. But if it was a stranger on the road and I asked them for directions, they, they could be outright rude to me because I was a foreigner. And the same thing that made me have a bad experience as because I'm a foreigner, because I was a foreigner in a country, um, I had a good experiences of being a foreigner in Nigeria. Because I was a foreigner, I was given, you know, extra attention and probably like um, I was, people were being nice to me because I was foreigner. But then again, in Nigeria, I would have, uh, say, officers uh, on the road and you know in the hospital and other places stop me because i was a foreigner probably trying to take advantage of the fact that i was a foreigner and trying to make money out of it uh which i would try to escape by letting them know i was very much a nigerian <laughs> and not all that of a foreigner anymore um and um united states of america i think what i don't and uh, like and have had ex bad experience not i wouldn't say per say bad experience but what i've struggled with is is paperwork there is so much documentation and so much paperwork with everything and anything you need to get done in in america so i think out of the top of my head those are the few negative experiences i've had um Coming to the question of um, STEM and humanity. Uh, yes, I, with all my experiences, one of the biggest lessons I've learned is um, the way I connect to any human being when I meet a hum another person is not, uh, not 
with the STEM in my mind, but in the hardcore of them being a human, what do I have in common with them? Maybe the person I'm meeting is a, of total different nationality, speaks a total different language, but because both of us are mothers and that is what is common between us, connects us on the human level and we share that. Um, maybe I'm meeting a person who um, is um, not in the medical field, the, not in the same nationality, but um, is about to get married. And that is going to connect me with them because I have experience of what is going to change for them um, getting married now. And that's what's going to connect me with them um, on a human level. So very, very rightly put, it STEM and cannot stand on its own. It has to be STEM and humanity going hand in hand together. Um, I think um, that's what I have to say. I hope that answers yes. everybody's yes. questions. Yes, you have really done justice. You've done justice to the comments. I saw Professor Bell at this hand up sometime. I don't know whether he is still interested in making his comments. Um, well, I wanted to support what uh, Professor Tijani said. Um, I remember Nigerian Academy of Letters, um, you know, being very strong on the fact that the humanities uh, need to complement the new fad, which is uh, STEM. Um, you know, I really enjoyed uh, Dr. Ndoma's uh, presentation, very wonderful. Uh, somewhere in the middle of December last year, uh, there was a conference in Abidjan on by, I think, um, uh, the university there and the colleague from uh, Burkina Faso uh, on migration. Um, and I thought that um, I will send a message back to uh, Professor Drago to link up with you because what uh, was just presented today is very close to what my daughter, uh, uh, Professor Tolu Kwebewaji presented at that conference like, uh, at a very young age and um, went to do her PhD in the US at a very young age, came back to lecture and is now back as a professor in the US. So the, the point I wanted to make is to thank uh, Dr. Ndoma uh, for the positive way she handled all the you know, dislocations which <laughs> migrating from Yemen to India, to Russia, and to everywhere, and then ending back up in the US uh, would have caused. It can be disorienting, but she has you know, shown that um, uh, with positive attitude and preparation that this, this could be very wonderful in the making of who you become. And so thank you, uh, Dr. Ndomo. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for just coming. I can see that uh, we have a, a young participant there with Professor Tijani. Do we have a comment? <laughs> <laughs> As you can tell our own story of, uh, from Abuja, Abuja to, to Baltimore <laughs> in years to come. I'm going to invite you to do that soon. Because you need to talk to us about your migration stories from US to Nigeria back to US. You need to give us your story too. But the next person we invite. Simona is not talking to us. I want to see your face and say hi. Simona, you don't want to say hi to us? Okay. Hello, how are you? Yes, this is a new year. It's good to see your face. Hi, hi sir, Austria. I hope you are enjoying yourself. Yeah, I can imagine. She's our, she's a PhD student in Austria. She's from, she stayed here with us for about two weeks. 
here in Abuja. So I'm sure she was enjoying your story. She will have her own to tell too. She's a mic, she was a migrant, isn't it? Now you are no more a migrant. <laughs> oh, yes, you're a migrant. So thank you so much. It's been really a wonderful day. And I think uh, though not many people on this platform, but the few of us here, I think uh, had a nice time. I think internet challenge may be a big problem. I don't know. It's like it's very bad today. But then we hope that the one we shall have in a fortnight, I uh, will not call the person's name yet, but I know that uh, you will soon see the poster and we will all try to be here. It's our very own. This one is not a migrant. It's from National University of Nigeria. So you will tell us the migrant story <laughs> he has for us. So I won't call the name. I won't call the name because I know that you all know the person. All right, as it is, it looks like uh, we are going to call it a day. And I want to ask Dondoma uh, maybe to say her last word to us. Any comments to say bye-bye to the platform? Any last remark before I say bye-bye to all of us? So Delphi, Doma, I'll pass you. I think it's, it's been an honor to be able to present among all, I mean, uh, highly educated and experienced people who are uh, much older than I am and that you guys were um, humble enough to let me speak and learn something from me. And I think the department is doing a great job and, and this, is, this has been quite an experience interacting with everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge your experience with us it's been quite uh, engaging very interesting and uh, as someone said we're happy starting the year with this kind of information we like practical you know as a doctor you know you do theory you do practical so this is a practical side of migration and then of course we have theory from time to time so we are really very very happy and we want more people i want to say people on this platform please direct people to this platform so that we can have Many, many. I need you all to help me to get it right. I need everyone. We need people to come around. People like shy away from presentations, so we want to encourage people to present. We are going to have a seminars. Uh, you know, we can have a small seminar. We can have a roundtable. We need people to give us ideas to help us to get things done rightly. So we need all of you. Just contact me. Uh, it's very simple. My phone number, my email address is there. I will, from one to the other, get it. everybody here has my phone number. Everybody here, I can, I dare say that, apart from, I'm not sure of uh, and, uh, whether Professor Ray and I did that for, and somebody has just come in. Okay, this one is uh, maybe Dr. Tolu Bewaji. I'm sure it's the, related to Professor Bewaji, I think. So, but every other person here has my number. So I, I guess it's going to be easy to communicate and talk to me about anybody who wants to do something or say something on this platform. So I'm asking, soliciting for your support so that we get it going and make it interesting for everybody. So on this note, I want to say thank you once again for being part of this. We have started and by God's grace in a fortnight, we'll be back again. And we hope to continue like that throughout the year. Dr. Doma, we appreciate you. Thank you, everybody, and have a blessed day. Thank you, and bye-bye.